So now let's take a look at exercise 19 on conditional arguments. You have a series of arguments in natural language. You'll need to translate into standard logical form four conditionals, right? Then determine if the argument is valid or invalid. And if it is invalid, identify the particular fallacy that is committed. So we'll begin with number one. Should the situation arise that significant budget cuts are required, it is apparent that Mary's job will be eliminated. The production manager has indicated that there will indeed be major reductions in the budget, so Mary will be going on unemployment. So as you look at the natural language argument, perhaps the first step is to identify the claim, uh, which will become the conclusion in the conditional argument. We see the logical indicator so here, and that tells us that Mary will be going on, on unemployment is the conclusion of the argument. So we take the other two statements as the premises. We're looking for the conditional form here. Because we're in natural language, we won't always have and very often won't have the standard logical form of the logical operator if then. So we look for variations on that. And indeed in the first sentence, which is the first statement, we begin with should the situation arise, which is one way of saying there is a condition here. In other words, here's the antecedent. So should the situation arise that significant budget cuts are required, it is apparent Mary's job will be eliminated. We take all of that as one statement, and it's the conditional statement. So we would put that into standard logical form as if budget cuts, then uh, Mary uh, is laid off. Then we get the second premise in the second statement here. The production manager has indicated that there will indeed be major reductions in the budget. So we add in the second premise and uh, budget cuts. And now we have enough to test the argument for validity. We have the conditional statement, if there's budget cuts, then Mary will be laid off. Um, and the second premise, budget cuts. So we look at how the second premise relates to the first premise. And the second premise, first of all, uh, refers to the antecedent, and then it also affirms the antecedent. And that allows us then to conclude with certainty, we get to the conclusion then, um, Mary will be laid off, right? And we can arrive at that conclusion with certainty because this is a valid conditional argument. Why? The second premise affirms the antecedent. Number two, the potatoes will never grow unless they are adequately fertilized before the first heavy rain. Arthur, my neighbor, however, luckily fertilized his potatoes three days ahead of the first rain after planting. I'm sure he can expect a good crop. So as we read this, again, the first thing we want to do is find the conclusion. You find the conclusion and kind of set it aside because it doesn't help you determine the validity of the argument. And in this case, we look at I'm sure that tells us here's a concluding speculation, right? A predictive claim, if you will. And that claim is based on the combination of the evidence statements or premises which are articulated elsewhere in the natural language argument. So we'll set this conclusion statement apart and then look at the remainder of the argument. Now we have a conditional statement that's signaled by the word unless. Now remember when we talked about the word unless earlier in the semester, we mentioned that you read unless as a negative condition, that is, as if not. And so we would translate into standard logical form as if the potatoes are not fertilized, then 
potatoes won't grow. And then our second premise says Arthur fertilized his potatoes. So we say potatoes are fertilized. But you notice that this premise now denies the antecedent. We have a negative antecedent here. Potatoes are not fertilized. So we know what happens if they're not fertilized, but we're never told what happens if they are fertilized. So the second premise, which denies that antecedent, that is, it offers the opposite. It says the antecedent hasn't come about because the antecedent was negative and the second premise is affirmative. So we have an invalid argument here, and it's invalid because it commits the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Number three, if anyone carries a beer onto the fraternity property, the fraternity will lose its charter. But the fraternity has put up an electric fence to keep out drinkers. So the fraternity will not lose its charter. So as we look at this argument, again, we want to find the conclusion first. So is the indicator here. Here's the conclusion. Fraternity will not lose its charter. So we'll note that, but set it aside. We'll look then for the conditional statement signaled clearly here by if. If anyone carries a beer onto the fraternity property, then the fraternity will lose its charter. So we'll put that into standard logical form here. Um, if beer on property, then loss of charter. And then we look for the second premise. And the second premise tells us the fraternity has put up an electric fence to keep out beer drinkers. So we would read that as no beer on property. However, as in the previous example, we have denying the antecedent. The antecedent in the conditional statement says, if there is beer on the property, then the consequent of loss of the charter will occur. It does not tell us what happens if there's no beer on the property. So we cannot conclude for certainty, for certain, that the fraternity will not lose its charter. We only know what happens when there's beer on the property. We're not told what happens when there's no beer on the property. So we have an invalid argument. Again, the fallacy of denying the antecedent. So we'll go to number four. Under the condition that students are not informed of their rights before the conduct hearing, the appeals board is obligated to overturn the sanctions against them. But these students clearly were informed before of all their rights. So it is clear the appeals board will not overturn their sanctions. So in this instance, um, again, we're looking for a conclusion signaled here by the argument indicator so tells us this last statement is the conclusion and the evidence statements or premises of the argument precede this, right? So we look for the conditional statement and in this case again under the condition there's the variation on the if that tells us this is the antecedent students are not informed of their rights before the conduct hearing making the consequent the appeals board is obligated to overturn the sanctions. So we put that into standard logical form and we would make it as if um, no, if not informed of rights, then overturn sanctions. And I'm abbreviating here, but that's perfectly okay to do if it allows you to efficiently deal with the analysis of the argument. Second premise, these students were clearly informed before of all their rights. So informed of rights. But as you look at this, you see the antecedent is in negative form. If students are not informed of their rights, 
then the appeals board will overturn the sanctions. That tells us what happens if they're not informed. It doesn't say anything about what happens if the students are informed of their rights. So in this case, again, we have an invalid argument, and it's once more the fallacy of denying the antecedent because you have a negative antecedent but an affirmative second premise referring to that antecedent. So it's saying, in effect, the antecedent is not true. Number five, there will be a summer school boycott by faculty if the trustees do not settle the contract dispute before the end of the spring semester. But the trustees have continued to delay the process and refuse to settle. So it looks as if there will be a summer school boycott. So in this instance, again, uh, it's clearly a conditional statement. However, the antecedent and the consequent are in opposite order in the natural language argument. We find the antecedent here in the middle in the second part of the first statement, right? Again, we find the conclusion indicated by so, so we'll set that apart. But we want to rewrite that conditional statement so that it appears in standard logical form if trustees do not settle, then summer school boycott, right? And the second premise says trustees are not going to settle. And so we would conclude then that there will be a summer school boycott, and that's what the conclusion tells us in the natural language argument. Um, and this would be a valid argument. And why is it valid? Because the second premise affirms the antecedent. The antecedent is trustees do not settle and the second premise tells us indeed that's what's happened. The trustees are not settling the contract and so Based on the conditional statement, if the trustees don't settle, then there will be a summer school boycott, and the trustees did not settle, so we can be certain there's a summer school boycott. So a valid argument, because the second premise affirms the antecedent. Number six, if the candidate turns to negative campaigning, and if the number of undecided voters remains high, there is an outside chance that his opponent might be defeated. It is clear from the last two days of campaigning that the candidate has shifted tactics and is attacking his opponent on both policy and character issues. But the number of undecided voters is getting smaller each day, so it appears his opponent will be reelected. So now we're moving into a little bit more complex argument, the natural language argument a little bit more um, dense than the previous examples. There's more going on. So we want to read it carefully. Again, with argument analysis, we want to slow down our reading and be sure we understand all the parts of the argument. The conclusion is easy enough to find, again signaled by the argument indicator so, and the conclusion is his opponent will be reelected. So we'll temporarily set that aside and find the remainder of the argument. We're looking first for the conditional statement, and that's signaled by if. But if we read the whole conditional statement, we notice there's actually two conditions here. If the candidate turns to negative campaigning, and if the number of undecided voters remains high, then there's an outside chance his opponent might be defeated. Okay? So we have a complex antecedent here, which we would translate as if... Um, negative campaigning and um, undecided voters remains high, then we will get um, opponent may be defeated. So what this tells us is that in order for the consequent to come about, both conditions must be met. And the word and confirms that. 
So we need to have both a turn to negative campaigning and the number of undecided voters remaining high. Both of those conditions have to be in place in order for the consequent to follow. And then what does the second premise tell us? The second premise says, it is clear from the last two days of the campaign that the candidate has shifted tactics and is attacking his opponent on both policy and character issues. So the second premise says we do have negative campaigning But the next sentence says that, but the number of undecided voters is getting smaller each day. Negative campaigning, but not um, undecided voters remaining high. And so that tells us that one of the conditions has been met, but the other has not been met, which means that the condition of both antecedents occurring before the consequent can follow has not been met. So, in other words, this is an invalid argument again, and it is invalid because it's denying the antecedent. Certainly, one of the antecedents has been met, but they, but they both must be met, and in this case, only one has. So, the full conditions have not been established to bring about the consequent. So, it's an invalid argument because it's fallacy of denying the antecedent. Number seven. If the invention of time travel were possible, we would already have been visited by time travelers from the future, or we would have read about such a visit to the more remote past in our own history. But we have had neither any visitors from the future nor a historical record of their visiting any earlier age than our own. Therefore, time travel is not possible. So as we read this natural language argument, perhaps our attention is brought first to the therefore. This tells us the conclusion is time travel is not possible, and it is based on the two previous premise statements or evidence statements in the natural language argument. We look for the conditional. If the invention of time travel were possible, then, the implicit then, we would already have been visited by time travelers from the future, or we would have read about such a visit to the more remote past in our own history. So in this case, it's the consequent that is complex, because if the condition or the antecedent has been met, then one of two consequents could follow, right? We could have been visited by time travelers from the future, or we would be reading about the visits of time travelers to some earlier period in our own history, like time travelers showing up at the American Revolution, or time travelers showing up during the Civil War, or something like that. But in this case, the second premise tells us we have neither visitors from the future nor a historical record of their visiting any earlier age than our own. And that tells us that neither of those consequence has come about, okay? So if we put this into standard logical form, it would say, if time travel possible, then um, we would already been visited or there would be historical evidence of such a visit, right? And then the second premise says, neither of these consequence has happened, right? So we have no visits and no historical evidence of a visit to an earlier age. So this is a valid syllogism, or a valid conditional argument, I should say. It's a valid argument because the second premise denies the consequent. And it allows us to conclude then that time travel is not possible. Okay? And it's a valid argument because this second premise tells us neither of the possible consequence 
which are articulated in that conditional statement, neither of the consequences come about, which means the second premise denies the consequent. Number eight, it was clear that if the coach could not find a talented replacement for the player suspended for academic reasons, then the team would lose its key playoff game. And since the papers reported that the team lost in overtime, I conclude that the coach never found that talented replacement. It's time to relax academic standards for athletes. So here we have an argument uh, and we look for first the conclusion. So we might take this as the conclusion of the natural language argument, but it is not part of the conditional argument. The conditional argument concludes here. I conclude that the coach never found that talented replacement. And then based on the outcome of the conditional argument, the arguer continues to advance a policy claim supported by that conditional argument. But our interest here is only in the conditional argument. So we look for the I conclude the coach never found the talented replacement as the con conclusion of that conditional form. So we go back to the rest of the argument and we find the conditional statement. If the coach could not find a talented replacement, then the team would lose its key playoff game. Okay, so we'll translate that into standard form. It's almost there as it is, right? Um, if no replacement, then lose playoff game. And then the second premise tells us the papers reported the team lost in overtime. So loss of playoff game. Now, if we look at that premise, we note it refers to the consequent, right? And it affirms the consequent. It says the consequent has come about. But this is an invalid form of the argument. We cannot conclude with certainty that the, the loss occurred because the condition was met. It could have occurred for any number of reasons. There may be any number of conditions, in other words, that led to the playoff loss. We don't know what those other conditions are. We only know from this conditional statement that one such condition is no replacement was found. But because there are other possible conditions with which might produce the same consequent we cannot conclude with certainty that the loss occurred, as is the conclusion in the argument here, that the coach, because the coach never found a talented replacement. So this is an invalid argument, and it's invalid because it commits the fallacy of affirming a consequent. Number nine, the encyclopedia salesman offered her a great deal. If she bought the subscription to the full online digital version today, she would also get the leather bound 30 volume printed set for free. And she has the 30 volume set. So I guess she must have taken the deal for the digital subscription. So as we read this natural language argument, we can easily find the conclusion here indicated by so. I guess she must have taken the deal for the digital subscription is the conclusion of the argument. And then we are in search of the conditional statement. Uh, we have an if here, if she bought the subscription to the full online digital version today, then implicit then she would also get the leather bound 30 volume printed set for free. So as we translate that into standard conditional form, if uh, purchase digital subscription, then 30 volume set. So we have an antecedent, she purchases the digital subscription, it follows that she then gets the 30 volume set Second premise tells us she has the 30 volume set. But as you look at this, you recognize the second premise here affirms the consequent of the conditional statement. So we have another invalid argument and it's invalid because it commits the fallacy 
of affirming the consequent. And then finally, number 10. Under the condition that our adversary does not surrender, we would be forced to obliterate his colony. It appears that our adversary will surrender since he has sent a delegation to negotiate terms. It follows then that it will not be necessary to obliterate their colony. So in this case, again, natural language argument, but we're looking for the parts of the argument to figure out the structure of the conditional argument. It follows then, tells us, here's the conclusion, right? It won't be necessary to obliterate their colony. And then we look for the conditional statement. We don't have an if, but we have something close to tell us this is clearly antecedent under the condition. So that's the antecedent, our adversary does not surrender. And the consequent is we would be forced to obliterate his colony. And then the second premise says it's apparent our adversary will surrender. Our adversary will surrender. And this part of the argument, since he has sent a delegation to negotiate terms, that is evidence in support of the second premise. And the since tells you evidence follows. But what is that evidence doing? It's supporting the, the claim that the adversary will sur uh, surrender. In other words, it's supporting the truth of the second premise. So now we have the parts of the argument to translate into standard form. And we can do that as um, if adversary does not surrender, then obliterate the colony. And the second premise tells us, with the support of the evidence, right, adversary will surrender. However, this is denying the antecedent. We have a negative antecedent. The adversary does not surrender, but the second premise um, denies that. It says the adversary will surrender. In other words, it tells us that that antecedent did not occur. And so we have an invalid argument, and it is fallacy of denying the antecedent. So there's a review of homework exercise 19 on conditional arguments. When we get molecular arguments on the quiz, you will have a combination of both conditionals and disjunctives together to figure out. You'll first then need to determine whether the arguments are conditional or disjunctive, and then proceed to test their validity. And for the conditionals, you would follow the method that we've demonstrated here. So if you have any questions on conditional arguments or on testing them for validity, please post your questions to the discussion board.